Okay, I think uh, I think we're ready to get going. So, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today again. Welcome. It's uh, so great to see you all again here today. We have about fifty participants. More getting admitted. There's a lot of people on YouTube, so it's very exciting to see you all here again. Um, and at Spark Mentoring, our motivation is to help you navigate some of the challenges you may face as you traverse your professional journey. So that's uh, what we are about. And quickly, I'm sure you probably have already seen the flyer circulating, so I won't go into much detail. But uh, for those of you who are seeing this for the very first time, um, we are hosting two seminar series, a workshop series focusing on soft skills and a second series focusing on career guidance. Two Saturdays ago, we had the first workshop on how to make an effective presentation and we got a tremendous response from all of you. So thank you so much. All of you thought that the session was really helpful and several of you have reached out to us personally to uh, let us know that uh, it has helped you in your lives. And we are very touched with all of the positive feedback and you know, we really hope to continue to deliver in a similar fashion. So today we'll kickstart our career guidance series. And our first series uh, session is on the path to academia. And we are very confident that you'll find today's session very beneficial and enlightening. So academia, teaching is a noble profession. And I personally feel that it is very rewarding because you can directly touch and uplift the life of so many people on a day-to-day -day basis, right? But uh, getting into academia and becoming professors is not a cakewalk. You know, you need to have a strong passion for research. You need to be a visionary to come up with new ideas, guide students and run your own lab. So you know, it might be something that excites some of you, but you're not sure of how to go about it. Or some of you may be on the fence about taking up this as a career path. So we'll try to tackle some of those concerns in today's session. So today you'll hear from two ICT alumni who um, are currently professors uh, and have joined academia relatively recently. And they'll share their learnings and insights um, and everything that they learned during their journey and how they got to where they are today, right? So that'll give you a glimpse of what this path entails and you're better prepared uh, if you think of this and uh, of this career journey. So uh, with that, let me introduce our speakers for today. We have with us uh, Dr. Prajakta Dandekar Jain and Dr. Tej Choksi. Very glad to have you both here. Uh, thank you for being here. So Dr. Jain, um, she is a UG assistant professor, UGC assistant professor at the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Technology at uh, Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai. She completed her PhD in the same department in bioprocess technology in 2010. After that, she was the first woman researcher to receive the Respire Long-Term Fellowship from the European Respiratory Society Marie Curie Co-Fund. And um, she conducted research in siRNA delivery systems for alleviating lung infections in the Helmholtz Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences in Germany. She then joined ICT as a professor in 2012, and currently her group's research work is focused in the areas of nanofibers, tissue engineering, upstream bioprocessing, 3D cell culture technology, and green technology. Quite an impressive scope, I would say. So far, she's guided five PhD students and over 25 master's students. She has authored 72 research publications, two books, seven book chapters, and has been award awarded three design patents and also several other awards, which I won't go into today or we'll run out of time, right? So, uh, and our second speaker is Dr. Tej Choksi. He is an assistant professor at the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He graduated from ICT Mumbai uh, in 2012 with a bachelor in chemical engineering. He then obtained his PhD in chemical engineering from Purdue University in USA in 2017. And from 2017 to 2019, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the SunCat Center for Interface Science and Catalysis at Stanford University, uh, again in the US. And after that, he joined NTU as a professor in December 2019. And his research group combines first principle methods with 
statistical thermodynamics and kinetic modeling to engineer catalysts with atomic level detail. And he has established a unified stability reactivity models for high throughput screening of catalytic architectures. So again, very impressive. Thank you both again for being with us here today, Dr. Jain and Dr. Choksi, and for willing to share your stories. I'm sure we'll have plenty to learn from your talks. So um, I, I'll quickly I'll let you guys uh, quickly share your stories. But before that, I just wanted to uh, do some housekeeping, talk about how to ask your questions. You know, as we progress, you all may have several questions, and we encourage you to post all of those questions on Pigeonhole. So um, the details are on your screen. Go to www.pigeonhole.at um, right here, and then enter the passcode 30 Jan 21. Okay, and again, you can post the questions anonymously. You can like questions that have already been posted. They'll climb up and they'll have um, a higher probability of getting answered. And don't worry if the slide goes away, um, the link will be available in the chat window. Uh, one of us will post it down there. So post the questions as they come to you. Don't wait till the end. And if there are any issues that you're facing, then please post it in the chat. So with that, um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Jen to start uh, sharing her story. Dr. Jen. Oh, thanks a lot, Anusha. Uh, I hope my screen is uh, seen. Yes. Yep. All good. So good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm very thankful to Amar and Anusha and the entire team of uh, Spark Mentoring Initiative for inviting me today. I think it is a very appreciable task that they have undertaken, and I wish them luck with mediating it. Uh, good luck to both of you and the entire team. So before I begin, I want to make a small disclaimer. So having a career in academics wasn't something which I had planned since my undergraduate days, but uh, more or less something which I accepted with the flow. And by saying this, I'm not trying to advocate that you shouldn't be planning your career, but I want to stress that at the same time, it is very important to have your plan Bs in place and to wholeheartedly embrace them uh, so as to be able to bring, build something which is uh, meaningful. So I am going to spend some time on this slide, uh, defining the general rules of an ideal presentation. But that is because I really spent a very long time at ICT, probably uh, a little more than my schooling tenure. And I've thoroughly enjoyed being a student here. To be frank, BFARM wasn't my first choice, but it was definitely my second one. And there were two reasons for this. One. I was awed by the beauty of its campus when I was here in the summer after my HAC examinations to inquire about the various courses that ICT had to offer. And two, admission here was considered as a gateway to America. So I had decided for various reasons that if I would not be able to pursue a degree in a government medical college in Mumbai, I would be pursuing a career in pharmacy in the US. And since I knew where I wanted to be after my graduation, I worked for it. In those days, and probably due to a lower exposure to the various social media platforms, we had a lot of vertical interaction with our seniors and lateral interaction with our peers, even from the other branches at ICT, which I feel is a bit lacking now. But I think that it is extremely necessary to have this interaction because these guys are immediately ahead of you. And they end up giving you some of the excellent advices with regards to the choice of universities or cultures within the universities once they've already reached there. And probably some of them may also help you with settling in different countries if you happen to be in the same universities as them. So my seniors had advised me to have an impeccable career record, have good grades, extracurricular activities, and all. While I studied regularly, primarily because I'm not really a last minute person, 
uh, being at ICT also introduced me to various extracurricular activities. We were a small close knit batch of just 20 of us and we participated in various intra and inter college cultural festivals and events, which gave us ample opportunity to interact with our peers and colleagues from other colleges. During that time, we also interacted with our PhD seniors, the research associates who helped their guides in conducting our laboratory courses. And uh, I happened to write a review article with one of them during my undergraduate years. So this was like my first exposure to a detailed literature review. And this experience stayed with me and helped me throughout my research tenure and is helping me even now. What I think I missed out and maybe could have been important in, uh, for me was undertaking a short research project with one of my teachers at ICT. But I think nowadays students have already realized the importance of uh, you know, conducting this research project. Working on a brief project helps you to understand what is happening uh, in a particular research area in your university and worldwide. And it is all, it'll also help you to understand whether you really want to be in research for a long period of time. It would probably have earned me a fellowship for my uh, master's degree in the US, which for some reason I did not manage to get despite being a topper all through my UG years. And then 9-11 happened. Uh, which resulted in a lot of visa rejections and our batch being at the cusp of this catastrophe. Three of us from my batch, my class, ended up without a visa uh, to go to the US. And that was a shock to me because I had spent all the four years in being prepared for pursuing my higher education in the US. And I never had really paid any attention to having a plan B. So here I was totally confused and scared as to what, where I would land. And at that time, Vandana Ma'am, Professor Patravale, who is here with us, she came to my res rescue and offered me a research associate position in her laboratory. With her, I learned about microemulsion-based drug delivery, which was a new area back in 2003. The culture in her lab was fantastic, and it gave us complete freedom and loads of encouragement to think and to execute and to carry out our plans. And it made me realize as to why hadn't even I considered pursuing a career at ICT or in India. So eventually through the year, I prepared a plan A of pursuing an MPharm in pharmaceutics with Vandana ma'am, or a plan B of working in her laboratory for any other degree, I was now being careful. But at the same time, I also continued applying to universities abroad as probably my plan C, in case I did not get to get a chance to work with Vandana ma'am. So while I had admits and full fellowships from good universities in the US and Canada in the subsequent year, I decided that I wanted to pursue an MTech degree in bioprocess technology under her guidance. Bioprocess technology was a very new field to me, away from pharmaceutics for which I had developed a liking while being a part of her lab. But the best part of this course is that it uh, attracts equivalent participation from pharma and uh, chemical engineering graduates. While the principles in uh, chemical engineering were a little difficult for us to grasp, our engineering colleagues uh, clarified our concepts through uh, thorough discussions and actual chalkboard teaching. And we did the same for them for their bio-related courses. Again, uh, since it was a small class, just a moment. It was a cla small class and we had ample opportunities to interact with each other and also the visiting faculties. And we had a whole lot of them uh, coming over to teach us from other organizations. As a part of the coursework, I also worked with Dr. Apte's laboratory at Bombay Hospital. So uh, this was kind of an internship uh, in between the two years of my coursework. And not many had opted for him because he was a very senior person who had worked um, as a postdoctoral fellow with Professor Crick of the Watson Crick duo. Um, even I wanted an exposure to the biotech industry and hence he wasn't my first choice. But our course coordinator back then, Professor Smita Lele, and the ex-director of the ICT at uh, Jalna campus, she advised that I should be doing my internship in his lab. And I must, I'm really thankful to her because I thoroughly enjoyed working with him. And it also exposed me to the clinical importance of laboratory research and strengthened my exposure to the world of mall bio principles. So with this experience, internship experience, and the amazing research experience with Vandana Madam, with her thorough guidance, encouragement, and support, I decided to do a doctoral degree with her too. 
Uh, at that time, the entrance examination uh, required us to present a research idea in a detailed format. I already had this exposure being a part of Vandana Ma'am's lab when I worked with my PhD seniors in drafting research proposals and planning research work. So the entrance exam was quite a straightforward task and I uh, secured highest marks for my branch and eventually received a fellowship from the University Grants Commission to be able to pursue my research with her. Along with my doc doctoral research, I also, um, I also happened to work or participate in an entrepreneurship competition, which was organized by the Department of Biotechnology or Government of India, which was the first initiative that they had undertaken with similar organizations in the UK. And ours was one of the four teams that was selected all over India to present the research idea at Oxford or UK. So this participation shaped my outlook on how uh, research should be planned so that, so that it benefits uh, the public directly. While my research lab currently hasn't uh, reached the tech transfer stage, we are working uh, towards making that a reality. Uh, and I definitely suggest that such participation as a takeaway from today's session, because it introduces you to the financial aspects of research, something which you easily tend to overlook during PhD and postdoctoral research, but which is very, very important when it comes to running your own research lab. During this time, I also met my partner and my now, now my husband, Dr. Ratnish, who is also a faculty at ICT. Both of us wanted to spend some time abroad for getting exposure to international scientific and research culture, but we also wanted to work in the same city. So leave alone the same state or area, but in the same laboratory if possible. So following that, dual career dream was a challenge. Uh, there was a reluctance in accepting couples when you approach uh, PDF supervisors because they do not really see you as individuals when you approach as a couple, but moreover as a team. So while we contacted, uh, we started off contacting professors really early and while we approached many, we finally had an offer for a short term fellowship of only six months. Um, by Professor Laird, who has a reputed career in the area of pharmaceutical research in, in Europe. But we were also told to secure our own fellowship during the first six months to be able to continue our research there uh, further. We accepted this challenge. And while we were in uh, one of the most beautiful continents, the first six months were spent in tremendous work. The research work was about uh, SIRNA delivery, which was a new area. But we indulged in a lot of grant writing to various uh, European organizations to secure our salary and research funds. This experience was kind of easier due to exposure to this exercise during our PhD tenure, but it was a very fulfilling one and uh, it helped us to set our research lab once we were back at ICT. So we had a, it, uh, this experience also taught us the importance of having extensive collaborations and not trying to do everything by yourself. So uh, while we had many rejections in the beginning, eventually we have post had postdoctoral fellowships from the Humboldt Foundation and Marie Curie European Respiratory Society co-fund. His group was a Professor Lair's group was a diverse one with researchers from all over the world. And this exposed us to various scientific and individual cultures. We were paid well. We were in Europe in a city that shared borders with France and Luxembourg. And thus we had an excellent time professionally, culturally, scientifically, and personally touring around Europe during the weekends helped us to revitalize ourselves. And in this duration of less than two years, we managed to get out five publications, two book chapters, and an entire book, which was again Vandana Ma'am's gift to us. The takeaway from this uh, uh, era for me was that an equal importance should be given to work as well as free time. And uh, you should spend sufficient time in choosing a laboratory that gives you free freedom to plan and to uh, execute. Okay, so a position back at ICT was uh, sudden and unexpected. While we wanted to move back eventually to India, we were we did not expect a position to be available so soon. So positions in India, as I'm sure will be all around the world are met with a stiff competition and getting to two together in the same institution is a very big uh, task. So Ratnesh was more sure than me that he wanted to be in academia, but I was ready to give it a try. And although I had my own apprehensions, 
I competed with Ratnesh and two of my senior colleagues from uh, Vandana Ma'am's lab for a chair position on which I returned back to Mumbai to ICT and not to mention the other applicants as well. Another challenge was my preference or our preference or I would say rather stubbornness to be in Mumbai to be able to be close to at least one of our respective families. And while after giving the interview, we couldn't figure out our chances of securing the position. Um, my uh, background of being a master's in bioprocess technology and my postdoctoral research in the field of model bio helped me secure that position, which was instituted to encourage biotech related research at Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Technology. And I was back to the same institute, which was like a second home to me since my undergraduate years, but this time on the other side. So we started off with projects that were extensions of our postdoctoral research and slightly our doctoral research, but soon we felt that it was necessary to create our own niche areas and to move out of shadows. At the same time, we met Professor Yatin Gokan, a chemical engineering alumnus of ICT, who was back after two decades of work at, in the US and he worked briefly at ICT before moving back to US again. Over the period, he has been like a mentor to us and finally now we have started extensive research in artificial organ engineering and biopharmaceuticals, which are two of the major verticals uh, that my research lab pursues. So if you want to have an academic career in India, these are the various opportunities that are available to you. There, is, uh, there are CSIR labs, that is Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, we, which um, encourage um, interdisciplinary research. There is Council of Agricultural Research and Council of Medical Research Laboratories, the Defense Organization Laboratories, DBT and DST institutions. And uh, most of these would uh, encourage you to do research within specific mandates. Then there are central and state-run universities where the teaching component is very, very strong. And then there are IICs, IITs, ISOs, and of course, ICT, which has a strong re, uh, teaching as well as research component. <clears throat> when you plan to run your own laboratory, funds are a must. So these are the various grant opportunities that are available in India. Various uh, government organizations like DPT, BIRAC, CRB, DST, etc. offer you industrial, um, uh, individual level grants varying anywhere between 50 lakhs to 2 crores. They also give money uh, if you form consortiums with researchers in alternate laboratories, which varies anywhere between 3 to 5 crores and institutional grants, which are uh, greater than uh, 10 crores. BIRAC specifically um, supports industrial and translational research as well as uh, it supports uh, startups for a period of 18 months. Uh, UGC, um, University Grants Commission or UGC gives you minor, minor research grants as well as university grants. And then there are there, there is a um, uh, defense organization where um, individual grants can be obtained anywhere in between 50 lakhs to two crores. So this is what uh, I have figured out uh, out of building uh, our research lab um lab space you need to have an immediate lab space once you move back in certain places in certain organizations which i uh, mentioned on the previous slides there is an opportunity to even negotiate uh, the lab space next is a seed grant to establish the initial uh, infrastructure in your laboratory so that is possible by uh, a seed grant which are offered by some of the institutes like iits or then there are um, government funding agencies like ugc which give you seed grants as well the next step is to build your team, which is very, very important. Again, hiring of students is possible through seed grants, through institutional funds in certain cases, or through self-funded projects, um, which are given by or granted by any of the funding agencies that I earlier mentioned. So have, building a good team is necessary to follow your research and to be able to uh, publish in reputed journals. While publishing research articles may not be very easy at the beginning of your career when you are trying to build or set up your laboratory, at that time I feel that you should not be ignoring any chances of writing review articles or book chapters uh, so as to be able to you know, shape your CV. And finally, finding a research area that you feel fa passionate about. Ideally, that should be different from what you have done during your PhD or postdoctoral research. 
uh, it always helps if you concentrate or focus on research that is specific to the needs or the requirements of country or the region where you are located because then it is easier to secure industrial funding um, which is uh, give provided to you for more um, uh, practical research and it also helps you to solve problems relevant to a particular geographical uh, location where you are going to spend um, a large uh, part of your career so how does it move so after you set up a research group and establish long term goals for your group the next stage is maturing the ideas and uh, technologies uh, this is the stage where my lab is currently at the in the next stage you could have technology transfers and licensing of the technologies developed in your lab as well as you could think about uh, establishing startups so um, uh, the uh, indian the uh, environment in india scientific environment also encourages um, make in india in, there is a make in india initiative started by the government which encourages you to have your own um, ventures uh in government funding and at that time it helps if you have um, uh, industrial funding which is flexible in nature and which helps you to survive during these trying times some of the other things i have already discussed in my previous slides and finally um, to be able to enter into academics i feel that you should be able to build a good cv of course publications from your a uh, phd work your post doctoral work are a must uh, awards automatically follow if you have good publications uh, on your cv building a network with like minded people is very very important because these are also going to be your collaborators in future the next would be um, choosing an area of research it could either be fundamental research or industrial research and in certain cases even fundamental principles later on get trans uh, converted into technologies that disrupt the industrial practices a classic example is of the mrna technology the vaccines being available uh, for covid right now but it is important to follow uh, what you ha may have a passion for and finally uh, it is the choice of the institute or the region where you would be located for a significant uh, part of your career in india uh, you do not get opportunities to move on very quickly once you um, take numerous efforts to set up a laboratory and uh, therefore the choice of the institute and the region is uh, very very important so these are some of the points which i felt uh, was important and uh, i must thank you all for your patience uh, patient listening and i'll be happy to answer any questions later on thank you so much thank you so much that um was really great thanks for sharing your story and also sharing some several insightful uh, points one needs to get into academia i specifically enjoyed you breaking down the things that you need to get into academia pointing out the specific uh, th uh, specific points one needs to build a lab right also your road map i hope the audience also find found that uh, useful and helpful thank you um, Yes, thank you. So, um, as we said, we'll take all the questions. Open up the floor uh, for questions at the end of our uh, after after uh, Dr. Choksi shares his story. So, if you have any questions, again, please go to pigeonhole and post them. It's live, um, and then let, let I'll let Dr. Choksi uh, share his uh, story now, and then after that, Amar will take over and uh, con conduct the Q and A session. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Anu, for the uh, transition. And uh, I guess can you all hear me and see the screen? Yes. Um... Okay. All right. So uh, first of all, like um, I, I also really enjoyed listening to Prof. Dandekar's uh, uh, Dandekar Jain story, and it's not just inspirational to those listening in, but also to more junior assistant professors like myself who've just only started. So before I begin, I'd like to start with a couple of polls to perhaps clear some misconceptions about what academic jobs really are about. So uh, we'll probably launch the polls now and uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, start voting. Maybe we can like uh, wait till about 70%, uh, probably 60 people put in their votes. 
sounds good. Start voting, guys. Yeah, no, no negative marking and no wrong answers. So, so no, no stress. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, in three, two, and one. Okay, so let's uh, look at the poll results. A, about 65% of you think that uh, most faculty members spend time with teaching and academic administration. And uh, about 40% of you think that most PhD graduates become faculty members at universities. So I'll, I'll be sharing some parts of my stories and let's keep these two numbers in mind as the next few slides evolve. So this is just a, a timeline of my journey from ICT to where I am today. And instead, and, and what I'd like to chiefly focus on are these uh, decision milestones where I was uh, requested to sort of choose one fork versus the other. And uh, that's how I ended up here. So let's start with uh, uh, probably 2008. Like most uh, people, uh, we would like most people entering ICT, we'd give MHC, AIEEE, or JE. So my JE rank was not high enough to enter IITs, and I like chemical engineering. So then the best option outside the IITs, or perhaps even excluding the IITs, is ICT Mumbai. And that's where I went. Then a I uh, knew about this reputation which ICT had of uh, mentoring good researchers and I wanted to have a little bit of a taste of research and so for a couple of summers at the end of my first and second year instead of like uh, hanging out at High Street Phoenix or at Mysore Cafe I, I thought let's uh, try, uh, try out a little bit of uh, academic research. So I approached uh, Professor Bhange who taught organic chemistry to first year chemical engineering students. And I, I told him, I, I saw this cool thing about ionic liquids, you you work on on the same topic. I, I was amazed that these liquids basically don't, aren't volatile and they remain liquid across a extended temperature window. He, he said that the experiments are quite complicated, but I'd be happy to uh, let you work on a literature review so that you learn more about the subject. And I worked with this PhD student over that summer. That really excited, uh, it sort of sparked my uh, interest in research. And in summer, there was UGC graduate research fellowship on ICD students could apply for. And I crafted a proposal with uh, Professor Ashwin and Anand Patwardhan, looking at how ionic liquids can be used to separate a heptane from toluene, which is an important uh, chemical engineering unit operation. And so I study the thermodynamics of the phase equilibria involved between ionic liquids, heptanes, and toluene. That actually resulted in a research paper, which I was happy to contribute to, got published three years after I finished that stint, but, but it was quite uh, fruitful in that sense. After both these uh, research experiences and especially the core chemical engineering courses in my second and third year, it, it really, a sparked an interest in chemical engineering. And I decided let's uh, go down the PhD route because I can learn more about this uh, fascinating subject. So uh, like most of my batchmates, I decided to apply for PhD abroad and uh, I got a pre-admit to Purdue. The next decision point was which research group to join. And those who are planning graduate school or those who are in their first year, it is the most vital decision one can make because a PhD journey can have hiccups along the way because you're doing, you're breaking barriers basically. And if you have somebody supportive, it's better than having somebody unsupportive. So please choose the person, not the project. You can learn to like a different research area. Heck, most of us don't even do enough research till our first year of grad school to have a strong opinion one way or the other. But choosing somebody who is invested in your career, who is invested in your success is really important. And, and I was happy to have such an advisor, Professor Jeff Creeley at uh, Purdue. And uh, uh, in my fourth year of grad school, I was again at a crossroads. Should I choose an industry job or an academic job? But I realized that research and teaching actually energized me. So I decided to go down the uh, academic job uh, route. And uh, for most academic jobs now, you've got to do a postdoc. So I moved to uh, Stanford University for a short two-year postdoc stint. 
academic job searches as prof dandekar jain alluded can be quite challenging and it can go on for 6 to 7 months the entire cycle so from november 2018 onwards i was essentially thinking what are my first set of students doing and crafting these research statements which ultimately get you an academic job so now let's do a little bit of mass balance because all of us here are chemical engineers or technologists in my batch of 2008 90 students entered 72 went to either industry ms or mba and 18 went down the phd track among the 18 only two of us today by my uh, knowledge to the best of my knowledge are in academia professor manish kumar yadav who most of you all know at icd chemical engineering and myself who is in uh, ndu so at purdue university moving to a mass balance of grad school i had an incoming batch i was part of an incoming batch of 27 students out of the 27 students for various reasons six students left with a masters among the remaining 21 15 actually moved to industry and six were uh, wanted to go down the academic route so very few of us actually enter this career path we are discussing today most actually enter industry and among the six looking at a similar ratio after two years of postdoc out of six students on an average two would still be postdocs two would have migrated to industry and two would become faculty so for those who want to do a phd at least per my experience a about 7 to 10% actually end up entering academia in the end so it's a really small fraction of us most go into the chemical industry or or into the corporate world so the next question that we asked was uh, that we discussed was uh, what do assistant professors or faculty in general do so the day we start our jobs overnight we transition from being a postdoc to essentially running a startup we are the ceo the chief financial officer and the chief technical officer of that startup our performance is not measured by the bottom line in terms of profit but by the quality of the science our group does and the quality of the trainees that come out from the alumni from our group so in terms of typical time commitments of an assistant professor only one fourth of our time is actually spent in teaching most of which goes in preparing lectures assessments and actually delivering those lectures the majority of our time is spent behind training and mentoring research students be it phd students postdocs or undergraduate researchers to fund these students we've got to write research grants and to prove our capabilities and to share the scientific insights we've got to publish research papers so the things highlighted in blue are what most of the time gets spent in we also have to do academic service and uh, at least in my first year most of the time has been serving on the phd thesis committees of uh, other students and examining the phd theses in addition to that we also serve as uh, reviewers as uh, to academic journals and on research grants all this is voluntary service and uh, we don't get paid for such kind of service so like each time you're reading a research paper some faculty has spent probably 10 to 15 hours carefully perusing it and helping the authors improve their work so a uh, some short uh, six six small insights that i'd like to end with before we move into the q and a so if if you want to think about a career path path in academia i think these six traits are really vital especially going back my past experience have high levels of self motivation faculty don't have bosses we don't have immediate sort of uh, supervisors so we've got to motivate ourselves we've got to drive the research we've got to like uh, basically a uh, take the science from the uh, research experiment stage all the way to a publication embrace lifelong learning don't learn to pass exams but learn because you're curious this is something which all the undergrads here i strongly encourage you to uh, embrace one must be lion hearted don't be afraid of being wrong if you're convinced about an idea then stand your ground and if you're an undergrad student a good way to sort of learn this is embrace the difficulty in subjects embrace the complexity of certain questions give them a good try because in academia most of us have to face with rejection be it in the form of grants publications of some form or the other and in my opinion unless you are a unless you get your papers rejected you aren't really trying hard enough into the best journals so we have to be unafraid of rejection and and have a lion heart have a strong conceptual understanding in core subjects for us being transport thermodynamics reactors and math uh, 
because these concepts will be our lodestar as we explore uncharted realms. Attend seminars regularly. I know I was an undergrad in undergrad at ICD too, and we'd all be hauled out of the chemi lab to attend seminars by some foreign speaker or by some other uh, visiting dignitary. But those seminars are helpful because it helps broaden your mind. You learn cool science, and these seminars actually germinate new ideas, which you can then take into the grand stage, for instance. If those who are graduate students in the audience, please read literature. Spend about three hours a week reading scientific literature. Read widely, deeply, and critically, because only if you are well read can you actually cobble together different aspects to come up with a novel idea or package your research paper in a way that could be exciting to a certain journal. And lastly, take ownership of your research projects. If you're an undergrad researcher, grad researcher, postdoc, at any level. Take ideas to your advisor. Chart out the next steps, and and don't rely on your advisor to give you a uh, insight. So uh, show enthusiasm and take ownership. So yeah, so those are the six things I'd like to leave you all with, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tej. <clears throat> I think that was fantastic, especially the last slide where you uh, summarized those six points. And then one other thing that really uh, struck a chord with me is uh, your point on choosing the person. So this is something even uh, I agree with. Like choosing the person is more important than choosing the project. And I think that also uh, really shaped my uh, you know grad school experience. And you you think you know what you want when you're going into grad school, but you haven't seen enough to really make that judgment. So yeah, I I can't agree with that more. And the second thing I liked was how you uh, talked about your undergrad research experience kind of shaping your future choices. So you know if uh, there's someone in the audience who is considering academia, I think that. Uh, would be a great way to kind of test if this is something for you or not. Uh, all right. So with that, what we can do is we can jump to pigeonhole. I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, we have a good number of questions. All right. So the first one here is: How is the scope for job in academia and research abroad? and how should we find and explore more opportunities where to start so does either of you want to jump on on this one so i think uh, tej would be a better person since uh, it's it's more on uh, the scenario abroad yeah so so yeah i can i can get started with uh, that one and uh, uh, just a couple of points it most of the research careers begin with either doing a phd or doing a postdoc so look out for those opportunities and uh, uh, how do you find such opportunities the best way out is that we've got to engage with the icd network because you'll get a list of universities where where you know people have gone and had a good time there like and a successful time there so i would probably start there and uh, i would also like for instance a, there are some uh, web pages which uh, sort of advertise groups having phd scholarships like there for the for the computational catalysis a research area there's something called psyche.net so you can also look up such a web pages for this information thank you tej all right the next one is uh, what are the salaries of freshly joined professors assistant professors in india and abroad so we'll start with prajakta and then tej can weigh in yeah so ugc has uh, bands for assistant professors so the basic band varies between uh, 15000 to 39000 but then if you have uh, sufficient experience um, abroad as uh, Uh, as a pdf that is also taken into consideration and of course that is just the basic salary you have perks over and above uh, that you have allowances over and above your um, um the basic salary so i think uh, it places you quite well of course you cannot really uh, compare your salary in indian rupees with the salary that you may uh, earn in dollars or in euro but uh, i think that if you are um, in a decent university and um you are uh, uh getting to do what you want to do then i think the salary pays you quite well to have a comfortable uh, lifestyle thank you prajakta 
stage any thoughts on salaries abroad yeah sure so so like i would like to more look at it as a a percentage compared to say industrial salaries because of standard of living differences you can't really compare absolute values in general uh, the like this is what even my phd supervisor said if you want to be a millionaire quickly then joining academia is not what you should do if you like doing science you're passionate about it then then you join uh, academia a, if if i compare uh, the salaries say in either usa singapore maybe even in india then faculty get about 70 to 80% of what uh, say you would get in the industry just as a comparison i i don't know if i'm correct or wrong in that matter prof tandikar chair yes depending on what stage you are at um uh, also in india depending upon where, which university you are situated in um, you also have opportunity for industrial consultancy uh, there are opportunities for other scholarships that you can apply and which you get over and above your basic salary so as long as you keep on working i think uh, there is a chance to earn decently well of course it is nothing comparable to uh, industry uh, and like i said you can't really compare indian rupees with the other currencies thank you all right this is a good one how do you find the right mentor even if you are not sure what you are going to do after btech <laughs> tej do you want to start with this one yeah so the uh, it's actually a one line answer you you talk to the group <laughs> alumni you talk to the current group members because they'll honestly tell you what their supervisor is like so if you if you get any red flags then uh, like for instance if somebody is uh, extremely critical and uh, a basically uh, treats treats you more like a free labor rather than trying to mentor and train you then that's certainly a red sign a red flag and the second thing is have have multiple meetings before you finalize who your advisor is because you can gauge their personality it's it's very important such that your work style matches theirs if they are somebody who's very hands on and you need breathing space then it's not a good match if they are somebody who likes people to be independent but you need constant hand holding that also is not a good sign so like ha- having frequent meetings and discussing with current students and alumni prajita any thoughts yes i think i completely uh, agree with tej here and uh, being an ict and um, when the teachers are teaching you uh, you also get to know them while you are in the class and like tej said that if you meet them for a a uh, couple of times you come to know whether your research uh, interests or whether they are likely to give you the freedom that you uh, may want to have when conducting your research and i think uh, that is most important i mean uh, the guide should be able to shape you overall not just doing good research or having good publications but uh, an overall development of your uh, personality so encouraging you to participate in co curriculars and extra curriculars and um, yes so that is that is what i feel thank you both mm. <laughs> all right tej this one is for you yeah, yeah. sure so so like uh, this is actually again a very simple answer a uh, 0 dollars so this was uh, like all my education has been funded by us taxpayers and that is why there's a line in my thesis i sincerely acknowledge Uh, NSF, DOE, and by extension, the U.S. taxpayers for funding my education. So that's the advantage of doing a PhD or even a postdoc abroad. Like even Prof. Dandekar said that a uh, we get comfortable stipends. We certainly don't get industry scale salaries, but you do save some money. It's not that you have to put in a single dollar inside. So yeah, the answer is zero. And at this point, I want to uh, tell the audience that we do have a panel on how to uh, apply for further studies uh, for an MS or a PhD. I think later in the workshop series, and Tej is going to be one of the panelists there. So we'll see you again there, Tej. Uh, all right. How does the number of publications affect your chances of getting recruited as a professor in a good university? What are the other factors that affect your standing in the competition? Prajita, do you want to take a stab at this one first? So yes, your publications uh, they uh, definitely uh, would help you in getting the position because they uh, reflect the kind of research uh, you've done and uh, the kind of research you may uh, want to do uh, once in the institute. Um, about the other factors, I feel that uh, it is important for you to have a good network. 
so a network also gives you uh, references that you may require in uh, getting uh, positions because um that also tells the committee that you kind of can connect with your peers and you know kind of grow together and uh, yes having a couple of awards on your cv also does help uh, in in uh, catching the attention of the committee i mean it's not i don't know whether it's absolutely necessary but yes it does help to uh, get you an edge over the others who might be uh, applying for the same position Age, do you have any thoughts on this one? Yeah, uh, one point I'd say is that uh, impact of the publications matter, not the impact factor of the journal, but the impact of the science. So uh, the search committees are made up of experienced faculty, and they can gauge good science versus uh, or science which is incremental. So if you all are PH PhD or master students, focus on getting impactful science out. Thank you. All right. which countries universities are preferable or should be looked upon first while applying for phd uh tej sure it, to me it, it also depends on your personal circumstance so uh, like even even today whether you are looking at india or anywhere abroad you can get a solid research experience at any of the best places in india or multiple countries so it depends on your personal personal preference and if you are open to moving and exploring other cultures then i i if i were in your place i just apply to europe north america and india for instance because that's what i did when i was looking for a faculty position too like say anything to add to this no i i completely agree it all depends on your person personal preference um mm-hmm. and whether you have liked the culture of a particular place when you may where you may have done your pdf um and then if you may want to if you have done it in the us and if you want to explore some other culture then there there are also people who do their uh, pdfs in the us and then move over to europe to experience something different so uh, mm-hmm. it all depends on your liking at this point i think i'll steal a few minutes i do have a question for both of you uh, i'd noted it down so uh, you know now consider where you are now i mean i think for both of you i i at least consider this as a success where you are but if you reflect on the past decade what are some things that you did right probably not knowing back then that have served you well now and more importantly what are some things that you would have done differently knowing what you now know so i uh, i i don't know whether i have understood your question is it just um during the phase when we became professor uh, uh, teachers uh, i mean pro- assistant professors at the university or is it uh, what that helped us to transition into that uh, phase better the transition so meaning you working as a professor now were there some things that you did that worked out well that got you to where you are or some things that you know you would have done differently during the journey so the the focus being more on the journey so yes uh, like i also mentioned a couple of times uh, during my talk on um, writing research proposals uh, do when you are doing your phd or your postdoc definitely helps you to uh, have that kind of an understanding once you want to start your own lab so on that note i would also uh, we have now home papers and uh, the btec projects so uh, i i feel that just uh, getting marks is one thing but uh, i think people should pay the students should pay a uh, genuine attention to these factors because these are the small things that uh, help you prepare um, uh, for your future right uh, also um, uh, presentation making and uh, you should play, pay attention to all those aspects also so these are minor trainings that are given to you you are given various opportunities during your doctoral work your post doctoral work to present your research and that kind of prepares you it increases your confidence to be able to address a uh, a large audience and mm-hmm. that actually happens when you are standing in uh, front of a class now for btex and for specialized subjects we face a smaller audience but then there are my colleagues who have to talk to a class of 120 plus uh, people sitting in front of them and that would also eventually happen when you talk at conferences right so i i i think that all these uh, smaller aspects of learning should be taken quite seriously so as to be able to develop yourself better now what the one thing i think i missed out during my undergraduate years and which could have helped me is 
you know undertaking a small research project during my undergraduate years because it uh, i was kind of ignorant till i landed up in vandana ma'am's lab about what was happening at ict uh, to be able to have a a uh, clear decision on on whether i wanted to go abroad or i wanted to pursue my career in india and which eventually i made a decision right so if i have uh, experience on that early on even if you decide to have a career in india i would advocate spending at least uh, some time in a different country to be able to experience a different culture that uh, kind of you know expands your outlook to uh, look at things so i think all these things are quite important uh, when you are starting your own laboratory is <clears throat> we want to add anything to that yeah maybe just couple of quick things so uh, what 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 i thought i did well probably uh, was uh, uh, when i met uh, one very senior faculty at purdue professor delgas he actually told me read a lot and and i actually took his advice to heart through my phd and i read a lot so so i think it's helping me when i'm writing proposals now what i could have done better is start writing high quality scientific language earlier on because uh, we aren't trained to uh, uh, write papers and proposals we are trained to do research so but but writing is it doesn't come naturally to most people and it takes practice perfect thank you so we have uh, I, sorry may i ahead. ask a question if we have time or yeah no go for it <laughs> okay uh, i or short my talk time i think <laughs> no problem um i i have sort of an um big picture question if if you will uh it's a two part question so i just wanted to know personally to you guys uh what do you find rewarding about your job what keeps you going and as a follow up to that you know stage to your point about having just a 7% um go up uh, whatever rate into going into academia why should someone consider you know going into academia if they haven't already it can just be a consideration sometimes there are circumstances that don't allow somebody to go into academia it's there are several factors but you know why should somebody even consider this route Tej, do you want to start answering that first? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So, like, uh, uh, could you repeat your first question again? Uh, just, just, just personally, phrase. what you find oh, rewarding what I find about rewarding. your role, yeah. and yeah, what keeps yeah. you going? Yeah. So, like, I, I've only been been on this job since a year, but what I found most rewarding was actually in the last week, where uh, two of the students in my group, a former summer intern, and then uh, a finally a grad to undergrad student. the former intern got an internship at mathworks in the uk and uh, the undergrad student got a phd program with a full scholarship in uiuc in bioengineering so so these are the two things which i found most rewarding that that what we do shapes people's careers and um, the second one i guess what you said was why should one pursue a career in academia if you like science if you like research if that excites you energizes you then it's the best place to be in because you have full independence great thanks yeah rajesh like, did you want to add to that yeah so definitely whatever uh, tej has said is very true um, your you know, students getting awards is uh, also a very uh, happy moment that something which you have tried to uh, you know impart has actually uh, materialized or they landing up in good jobs is uh, or rather they uh, being peers so one of the students from our lab is already now a uh, faculty um, at the department with us so that indeed is uh, quite uh, fulfilling um the second question i am I'm, i'm sorry i just uh, uh, lost just, the track <laughs> no problem It was a big question uh, but the second question was you know why should if somebody has not thought about this path and they're just here for the first time listening to this whole career path for the first time why should they consider it uh, you know right so uh, for that part i i definitely agree with whatever tej has to say i don't think that i want to add anything further to that i agree i think it's hard to find a job with that much independence um mm -hmm. in 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 the whole front of science it's it's a it's a it keeps you on your toes and you're always with youngsters so you never get a chance to grow old so <laughs> that is something which is quite uh, valid point <laughs> yes uh, i i see 
uh, Patravli ma'am posted in the chat that we are our own boss. I think that's a fairly good enough reason to be in academia. Perfect. So we we are at time. I mean, we know we have uh, many more questions, and both Prajakt and Tej have graciously agreed to answer these in writing. So we will send out uh, written answers to all of these questions, so they will get answered. Uh, I just had like uh, a few, uh, just two closing thought slides. But before that, ma'am, Vandana, ma'am, do you want to share anything from your perspective, being in academia for I forget how many decades is it? Three. more than 3 decades yeah i'm so happy and it's such a fulfilling life and as tej and prajakta put it you know it makes us proud when our students do better than us and nothing can be more rewarding than that and i think that doesn't happen in industry that's a one major reason why you should take up academia it is so satisfying in all ways but just a word of caution do not select university where there is only teaching i think when it is teaching research interaction with industry you doing consultancy and then reaching out to population at large that's definitely more fulfilling than only doing you know monotonous teaching so we need to be really careful there while selecting and uh, both of them have done an excellent job i would say and covered up most of the points so thank you to both of them and to both of you too thanks perfect i'll start sharing again quickly all right so just a reminder the pigeon hole will stay open so you know you're still digesting this information something some question comes up later today or tomorrow please keep posting and the agent project will answer those uh, as for our next session so uh, we have uh, our next session is going to be a workshop uh, session on how to improve your communication skills something i am personally excited about and rahul sangodkar is going to lead this one this will be four saturdays from uh, today ict has uh, mid term examinations i think sometime in mid feb, feb so we were uh, considered about that uh, the next session after that is our second career guidance series called uh, brain gain and these are stories of two ict alumni who've gone further uh, who've gone abroad for further studies but then they decided to move back to india for personal reasons and uh, aditi works as a manager uh, manager at nika and uh, vidhi works as a research investigator at uh, biocon bms research center so we hope to see you all again for these uh, sessions and uh, Uh, so thank you tej and prajakta for your time today and in the past few months as we were you know working towards this uh, i personally believe you know if you can't see it it's hard to be it and that was one of our major motivations to uh, conduct a career guidance series like this one where you know we can give people a flavor of these different careers and professions that uh, our own ict alumni have right now Uh, next i want to thank our volunteers ridesh and uh, yash and jash and mitesh from the ict social media team for their continued support and doing all of this uh, you know behind the scenes work that make these uh, webinars uh, possible uh, we currently do have an opening for a design volunteer so if any one of you is interested in joining our team do let us know in our uh, feedback form which you should see in the chat window both on zoom and youtube Uh, visit our website write to us on gmail if uh, you have any thoughts and please please participate uh, in the feedback you know that is a way for us to know if what we are doing is really helping you and what we can do to improve and yeah spread the word and we'll see you in four weeks thank you amar and anusha and team thanks so much thanks thank you it was a great session yeah thank you all and uh, yeah uh, anu and i are going to hang around for a few more minutes so if anyone wants to chat do you have any questions uh, let us know yes um yeah um, mitesh will people be able to unmute themselves